Let's start the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Feistel. That's kind of boring, right? You can agree with me, though. 
And what I do is I tell them to give a little case study, a little mini case study of how they uh, rode in as the hero and saved somebody's bacon, right? Saved somebody from making a mistake or helping them out of a jam. Next slide, please. That's sponsorship activation. So this is, these are typical sponsors. And I couldn't have brought back the senators without a huge number of sponsors. And those sponsors are not just companies giving me money or us money to sponsor and bring back the senators' campaign, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it's also the fact that we had thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people who helped us in so many ways. We wouldn't have a hockey team today without that. So when I do a, a Realtopia and SKS Law Firm and Century 21 and some mortgage brokers and architects and developers and energy providers, when they sponsor me, I am really grateful because I couldn't do these events without it. So gratitude is part of what we do. So Shannon asked me last night on the webinar, how do you get sponsors? What, what is the key to getting sponsors? Where do you find sponsors? Everybody asks me the same question. I can't find sponsors. Yes, you can. Again, going back to my days with the senators, if there was an electrician in the building, I'd say to Mark, Mark, is he a season ticket holder? Mark would say, I can't remember. Mark, check that, right? So people who buy from you, right, you should sell to. And people who you sell to should buy from you. I don't know if I got that right, but you understand what I'm getting at. So look at your accounts payable. Look at your suppliers. Look at your clients. Those people want you to be around. Why do they want you to be around? Because if a plumber sponsors you by buying your season ticket or buying your product or buying your service, he or she is ensuring that you're going to be around and that they have a client. Next slide, please. Um, you guys know this? This guy, Mr. 67's here? Who's that? Jeff Hunt. Yeah, Jeff Hunt. He's the owner of the Ottawa 67. Said that the first year that he bought the team, the team wasn't doing very well. It had about 1,500 people coming to a game. And Jeff is a master marketer, and he got that up from 1,500 people a game to 7,500, then to 8,500 people a game. It was incredible. And about halfway through that first season, I was serving on his advisory board. I said, Jeff, you don't really need me on your advisory board. I think the senators need you on their advisory board. He is such a fantastic marketer. And one of the programs that he started, which I think was original to Jeff, once he was getting anywhere from 500 to 800 requests a year for minor soccer, um, you know, minor hockey teams, they asked for money. And Jeff said, look, Bruce, I'm on a minor league team, uh, you know, a junior team, and if I say yes to everyone and it's $500 or $1,000, that's $400,000, $800,000 a year, I don't have that kind of money. Next, please. So what he did was he practiced something, which is, you all know this, give a person a fishing rod, not a fish. And what he did, he did designed a program so he never had to say no to anybody. The foundation, a charity, not-for-profit, minor league team came and asked him for money. He could always say yes. And the way he did that was he said, what I'll do is I'll sell you 500 tickets, right? Sorry, 100 tickets uh, at $5 each, and you can resell them at $10 each. The difference is you can make $500 for your minor hockey team to go uh, to a tournament or whatever. And if you have 15 players on a team and 30 parents and hopefully 60 grandparents, what that means is if each one of those marketing channels sells one ticket, you, you sold 100. So he was able to create a marketing channel by saying yes to every charitable re request that he got. And he's moving tens of thousands of tickets this way. Give a person a fishing rod, not a fish. Um, this is actually a picture of when it was the, uh, I guess, Social Bank place. And you can see all the advertising we have on that building, uh, those huge signs uh, uh, facing uh, the Highway 417. Lots and lots of advertising. That's an incredibly important revenue stream, especially in a small market uh, like Ottawa. You know, we have about 1.4 million people between Ottawa and Gatineau. But, you know, compare that to Seattle, 4.5 million, the newest NHL team. It, we're still a pretty small market. Next, please. Well, we wanted to put those signs on the building, even if you've all seen them on the Canadian Tire Center. Uh, Jeff Kyle, uh, who worked for the Sands then, came into my office one day and he was gray and, and perspiring. He was really weird. He said, we can't put any signage on our building. And I said, what the heck? We're going to go broke if we don't have sponsorship and we don't have revenues. And he said, well, there's this new rule. I don't know if you guys know this. You guys all know these Todd signs, these little blue signs that you see on the 400 series highways? It's a... Uh, it's a, I had never heard of TAWS, you know. <laughs> it stands for Tourism Oriented Destination Signage. And what it is, is it's an American company that has a monopoly on signage along 400 series highways in Ottawa. Sorry, in Ontario. And what I said to Jeff, you've got to be kidding me. 
we can't put a sign within 400 meters. The Canadian Tire Center is certainly within that. I'd say, we're not going to accept that. So we, we talked to the province. The province said to us, there are two reasons why we do, you know, what politicians were like, they always have an excuse. And the excuse was, we wanted to get rid of visual pollution and clutter. <laughs> and I said, really? And we wanted to cut down on distracted driving. Go back one slide. Don't tell me that those little signs aren't, aren't, aren't a distraction. Certainly they are. So go back. So next one, please. So what they had essentially done is if you were a farmer and you had a land, a piece of property right somewhere here next to this uh, uh, highway here, all of a sudden you couldn't have you know, McDonald's restaurants of Canada on your billboard. So you had to take that down. And you were losing about $15,000 a year. Maybe that's not a lot of money to the folks in this room. Maybe it is. But to a farmer, it can be a very meaningful amount of money. It's worth about a quarter of a million dollars over a, a period of time. That's a lot of money. And so what I said to the Todd's people and to the province of Ontario, the minister in charge, is that you really, next slide please, you've really expropriated all the rights of all the landowners along 400 series highways without compensation. And that has been against the rule of law for about a thousand years. Anybody heard of the Magna Carta? No? Uh, people are saying no. Okay, the Magna Carta was in 1066, or that was the Battle of Hastings. But it's about a thousand years ago, there was a Magna Carta where they said you couldn't, the king couldn't just take your value without giving you compensation. So what we said was, we're going to sue you. That's okay. We're going to sue you. We'll sue the government of Ontario. We'll sue Todd's. And um, we'll get hundreds, maybe thousands of landowners all across Ontario who have property on these 400 series highways to join us. And we'll, we'll have it out under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada. You know, we do have something called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. You've heard of that, right? Thank you. And so about three weeks later, we got an exemption. <laughs> yeah, no surprise. So if you have, if you have an own a major sports franchise and you're next to a, a, a highway like this one, you can have a, a big sign or a bunch of big signs. But sorry if you're a landowner. So somebody, I'm too old to do it, but somebody here uh, or, or out in Ontario should get all these folks together who should still sue the government. That's what I'm <laughs> And so inside the building, there, uh, uh, Canadian Tire Center, there's lots of signs. So you see some here. Next slide, please. And one of the things I did when I met with Gino Rossetti, he was the architect of record for the Palladium, of course, now Canadian Tire Center. A brilliant. <laughs> I think I got one and off stage. Shall I stop now? Okay. okay. So uh, when I met with uh, Gino Rossetti, the very first time I said, Gino, I want you to design a building. He had done the Palladium or the Palladian sister building in, uh, in Detroit called the Palace of Auburn Hills. It was one of the first of the new generation of arenas. And I said, I really like your designs, but something I want you to do for me that will help us, Mark Bonneau and our whole group here, make this a success in a small market. He said, what's that? I want you to do architectural signage. And right away, Gino understood that he's an architect, he's an uh, amazing man, but he said, Anything that draws the eye, we'll put a sign next to it. So if you have a shot clock or an out-of-town scoreboard, we'll put a sign next to it. You will activate that sponsorship. And what's missing here, you guys? Activation, right? <laughs> There's a buzzer beater. <laughs> you know, if Gino were, were with us today, he would say, put a sign next to it. And he said, so good design is really important to your sponsors. You're going to hear a little bit later from Dan. Uh, he's a master of branding. You definitely want to have something that people can be proud of. Next slide, please. Um, I got a call from Tony DeGaris, who's running the Honda Center in Anaheim. He said, forgive me for asking this, Bruce, but how is it possible that little Ottawa has 20 or $21 million in sponsorship revenues and we at the Honda Center in the richest county in the United States are doing six and a half million? It's because we thought about where the signs go, good quality branding, and also how to activate each and every one of those sponsorships to appreciate what they do for us. Uh, when we're trying to get the team to bring back the Senators campaign, we sold 15,000 priority registration numbers at $25 each for a team that didn't exist. Right? <laughs> and we did it two at a time, right Mark? Yes. And, uh, and we had a lot of help from one of our sponsors, Royal Bank of Canada. Next slide, please. And so we sold those 15,000 PRNs, priority registration numbers, which got you a reservation for a season ticket for a team, as I said, that didn't exist. And we had 500 corporations each pitch in 500 bucks, and 31 original corporate sponsors pitch in $15,000 each. So we raised a little over a million dollars to help us with the bid. So what do we do for Royal Bank of Canada? How do we activate that sponsorship? 
What we did was we said, if you want to buy a PRN, yes, you can come to our office, but even better, you can go to any Royal Bank branch in Onward, get them, and pick one up. So we're driving traffic there, building customer loyalty uh, for Royal Bank, and, and, and they're co-branding with the auto centers. Thank you. Now, uh, if you want one of its many incarnations, this building also had uh, Carell's name on it when it was called the Carell Center. Why did Mike Copeland, uh, who was then the CEO of Carell, put his name or the company name on the plate? Next slide, please. Well, I never like to show the spreadsheets, but this is one that I really want you guys to focus on for a minute. And that is, you don't just sell uh, sponsorships based on a relationship. You sell it on the basis of an ROI, and this is one of the measures of ROI. As you pointed out last night, Chris, it's not enough, but it's one of the measures. So there were, at that time, the play was mentioned about 80 million times per year in the media, uh, in newspapers, uh, you know, and, and the emerging internet. And, uh, and, and if Mike had paid one and a half million dollars a year, it would be more today for the Navy rights. It meant that he was paying about $18.75 per thousand impressions, CPMs, cost per thousand. And that's very comparable to a major magazine, you know, Vogue magazine or something like that. Vanity Fair would be about $20 per thousand. A little bit more expensive than those bus boards you see everywhere, which would be, a, in those days, about $6 per thousand. Uh, quite a bit cheaper, though, than Google ads today and Facebook ads, which could be about $60 per thousand. Excellent. So I think Mike did it for, obviously, ROI purposes, return on investment, and also because he felt putting uh, Carell's name on a major building uh, in his adopted hometown was important. So there is an element of corporate social responsibility and guilt. <laughs> um, I wanted to show you this example. So it's not just for, for sports teams. It's for everybody. Everybody can do uh, something with sponsorship. This is a young woman who worked for me, a wonderful young woman. Her name is Senya. You can see her here on the right. And she speaks Russian, uh, French, English. She can sing in all three languages. She's an opera singer. That's a real gig and uh, Italian and German and maybe other languages as well. And she, and you can see her here, this is one of a, a little real estate investment properties that uh, I own with a group of investors. And she actually came to sing for about 20 minutes to bless the house. It was an incredible event. And afterwards she was crying. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, what's, what's the matter? You, know, well, you did a great job here. Everybody loved what you did. She said, I really, really want to be an opera star. She's an incredible um, opera star today. Next slide, please. And she wanted to go to St. Petersburg to study uh, with one of the great masters, and it cost about $20,000. And she said, I'm never going to have $20,000 to, to go and study. I'm going to get old, and I'm going to die. And, you know, my true calling, well, I have missed it. My why? You know, what did Mark Twain say? The two most important days of your life, the day you're born, the day you find out why. Sandy knew what her why was. Excellent, please. So I said, Sandy, I get some sponsors. Does that surprise anybody here? No. And she said, oh. I can't possibly. Who would sponsor me? And I said, I can think of a few. Next slide, please. Uh, I saw, <coughs> excuse me, I Googled uh, event planners in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. I got her 800,000 leads in about uh, three or four microseconds. And event planners, if you know something about event planners like Shannon has done tonight and Chris has done tonight, they always want something different, right? They want to invite the founder of the Auto Center, hopefully, to do a good job for you, right? But I said, imagine if you could have an A-level opera star come to your, your, your event. Wouldn't that be exciting? Wouldn't that be different, uh, you know, as opposed to having another DJ or another rock band? I said, Cindy, charge them $1,200 for an appearance fee and $300 as a contribution to your education and travel fund. Excellent, please. So she's charging $1,500 in appearance fee. This is a few years ago. It would be much more today. And, uh, and so you would think that the cost to hire Cindy for an event plan would be $1,500, but it's not. It's, uh, they will take uh, Cindy, they'll package her up uh, with the event, and they'll probably charge their client $2,500 or more for Cindy's uh, time. And so the cost to hire Senya is actually a negative cost. Does everybody sort of see that? The event organizer would make at least $1,000 on Senya's appearance, and maybe a lot more than that. So I said, well, Senya, I want you to learn negative cost selling. And I'm not sure if it's original. that's an original concept to me, but I think it might be. You have to be careful on this planet. There's 7 billion smart people, so you have, whenever you claim anything is original, you have to sort of qualify it. But I think negative cost selling is something I really, really specialize in and teach a lot. 
And I said, Sandy, you're, you're going to understand how to, how to do this, which she did. And I said, you've got to find two games a month in September, October, November of that year, and four in December, because there's all those Christmas parties, you'll raise your $20,000, which she did. So this is a very powerful selling tool. You should know your client's business almost as well as they do. I use spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet. I teach this stuff. And I have to tell you, this is one of the hardest things that I teach because I can do a three-hour lecture. I'm not, I'm not doing that tonight, by the way. I can do a three-hour lecture, and the next day people come to me and say, well, yeah, that's all for well and good, but I really want a million dollars from Rich Uncle Buck to start my business. Well, that's a fantasy, certainly in Canada. So understand negative cost selling. What that means is that you can demonstrate to your client that the cost of hiring you is less, hopefully much less, than either the increase in revenues that they're going to see or the decrease in costs or some combination of the two. That's negative cost selling in a second. All right. Uh, I used to teach at the Telford School of Management, and you probably tell them I'm a retired professor. And uh, students would come to me and they'd say, you know, we want sponsors. How do we find sponsors? I was the sponsor game, right, Shannon? And I would say, what do sponsors want from Telford? What do they want is they want to be able to get in front of the students, much as I'm in front of you, to recruit them, to sell them cars, to sell them insurance, credit cards, uh, uh, mortgages, homes, anything that they will need after they graduate. Those are your sponsors. And they went, oh, right. Next slide, please. So one of the sponsors for this particular event was the Bank of Nova Scotia. So the Bank of Nova Scotia set up uh, you know, in the Telford School of Management in the Demeray building, a week before the uh, event, a week after the event, they came to the event and they did it to sell the, uh, these students credit cards and to recruit them. Next slide, please. And so we actually looked at what is the cost for Bank of Nova Scotia to uh, sponsor that event. And what we found was, this, these are ridiculous numbers, but true, that it cost them 2500 bucks to sponsor them, but if they recruited just three students, um, and sold 10 credit cards, the lifetime value of uh, those recruits and credit cards was something crazy, that present value was something like $540,000. So when you spend $2,500 and you get that kind of return, it was an easy sell and the sponsorship sold out. Uh, this is another uh, former client of mine, Angela Gorn. She's one of Canada's top level triathletes. And she came to me, next slide please, and uh, she was already selling uh, sock jocks, but she wanted to sell jockwear. Jockwear is athletic pleasure clothes uh, made out of bamboo that doesn't retain water. For the guys here, you know that if you've got athletic wear, and no matter how many times you water it, it always kind of smells bad, right? Girls are a little bit easier to, to, to manage, but she had this idea to bring in this leisure wear called jockwear made out of bamboo. Next slide, please. So I said, okay, Angela, what can I do for you? Can I do a little bit of business coaching? She said, well, I'm trying to raise 1.1 million for my first order. It's going to come out of China. And, uh, you know, I was hoping to do it in four months. How are you doing? And she said, well, I've been at it about a year, a little bit more, and I've raised 50,000 bucks. So I, I thought about it for a minute. I said, well, yeah, you're going to be over 50 by the time you finish that. Or you might be dead. So next slide, please. Um, so. So uh, I said, you know, this is obviously not working. You can't wait 22 years to launch a uh, job where that's ridiculous. And it, let's, let's imagine for a moment that you guys are VCs, venture capitalists, and I come to you and say, hey, guess what, guys? I've got this great idea. I'm going to uh, create this new app. Uh, there's about 15 million apps. I'm going to create a new one. And I just need $10.7 billion from all of you guys to launch my app. Right? Yeah, you're all looking at me just the way that I thought you were. Uh, that's Uber's story. They raised over $10 billion to launch their app. Next slide, please. The only countries in the world where you can do that, I think, is the United States and China. All the other countries are shut out of that kind of thing. So we cannot, as Canadians or Australians or Brits or Germans or Swedes, you know, African, uh, doesn't matter. We cannot possibly compete in that way in that market. Otherwise, it would be like me racing Usain Bolt. And I timed myself Usain's fast. <laughs> Next slide, please. So what I said to Angela is, let's go in a different direction. She said, what direction could possibly work? I said, why don't we go to one of these department stores, many of which are failing, and offer them an exclusivity on job work in return for something? She said, what would we ask? Next slide, please. Well, let's go back to first what she was actually doing. She was trying to raise $1.1 million. And had she done so, had she been successful, which she was not, she would have ended up owning about 
30% of the business and the investors about 70%. I don't like that idea of somebody that I coach owning 30% of her business and somebody else owning 70%. So I said, let's just get rid of that for now. Let's do something else instead. Let's go to Macy's or, 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 or Hudson's Bay or whatever and ask them for an advance order of jobware for two and a half million dollars and ask for a 40% cash down deposit. A million bucks. And because we're giving them exclusivity, let's ask them for a sponsorship of $125,000 per year. Now, how much of that money that she received did she have to pay back? Anybody want to help me out here? Matt, what in the back? Zero. Say it really loud. Zero. Zero. <laughs> this is the beauty of what I'm trying to teach people. And it's the hardest thing that I teach. As I said, I can do a three hour lecture and then they, tomorrow one of my students will say, well, yeah, but I really want Rich Uncle Buck with his million dollar check. Well, this is Rich Uncle Buck. This is Macy's giving her a million dollar advance order, a deposit, 40% is not unusual, allows her to order her first batch of clothes and a sponsorship. So, if you don't mind going back to one slide, it means that Angela still owns 100% of that business and no investors are needed. For people who live everywhere except maybe the United States and China, that's the way to go. Next. Uh, so, most people think that equity is free. That if Angela had managed to raise that 1.1 million, it would have been free money. You know, Rich on the book gave her, no, but investors want a return on investment, right? You guys are going to have mutual funds. You hope it's more than 2% a year, right? So debt can be anywhere from 3 4% to as much as 15%, but equity, people who invest in your business, private uh, angels or VCs, want at least 22 24 26 28%. So equity is expensive, debt can be expensive, but the kind of stuff that I teach, bootstrap capital, sponsorship stuff, all the, uh, the advanced deposits that I was talking about with Macy's, that has a negative cost to you. That's a good thing. Um, I wrote a copy, uh, I wrote Don't Back Down, so a leader asked me if I'd write uh, the story of the founding of the Ottawa Centers, Don't Back Down, for the 25th anniversary of the team, which I did, and I think, Shannon, everybody gets a copy, so you're all going to learn way more about me and the team than you ever wanted to, but you get a free e-copy, and I, I wrote, I think they're also, everybody will get something, this is relatively new, um, I did uh, three uh, business cases and seven uh, real estate uh, uh, many cases, business cases, you'll get a copy of that. But I think I could sell 5,000 copies of practically anything, and so could you. How do you do that? You get sponsors, right? I just had somebody contact me, they're doing a contest, they're, getting, they're, they're expecting about 50,000 entries, and they asked whether they could send out 50,000 copies and don't back down, and give me a little bit of money for that. Now, what do entrepreneurs say when people want to give the money? Yes. A little again. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. So you can get. I'm going to kill myself here. <laughs> Chris, you should have been faster. <laughs> He's a hockey player. He should have picked me up. That's what Brandy would have done. Brandy's sexy with his Brandy with one arm. <laughs> so, what's that? So anyway, so if you're writing your, your masterpiece, just so you know, just to depress you a little bit, there's two and a half million books that were uploaded to Amazon uh, last year by authors like me. Uh, the average number of books sold by those people, 20. You know, your mom bought one, your dad bought one, your brother and sister, and a few other people. So, this, for, unless you're J.K. Rowling, there may be a few J.K. Rowlings in here, this is the way to go. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to go in a little bit of a different direction here, because this will blow your mind. Uh, this is Con Smythe who built uh, Maple Leaf Arts. He did it in six months. He built it in six months, where the, the Leafs used to play. And he built it during the Great Depression, but he didn't have any money. It was 1931. The building cost all of a million and a half dollars, but he didn't have any money. So how did he get it built? He started to print out script. What is script? It's like Canadian Tire Money. It's like Disney dollars, right? He started to print that stuff up. And if you were an unemployed art worker, you would go there and, you know, either you stayed at home and, and were miserable, or you got up and went and you earned wages, not Canadian dollars, but in, in script. And he said to everybody who worked on the, on the building, Guess what? If we're successful, we'll redeem it for Canadian dollars. If it's not, your money is, you know, you can wallpaper your wall with it. And fortunately for the local folks who worked on it, the Carlton Street cash box became very successful and he was able to redeem every single dollar. Thanks, please. So you can see that Disney has done this for years and years and years. You know there's about 1.2 billion Disney dollars sitting in, in, in drawers around the world today. You know, every, every child, every grandchild has at least some of that. And 
Disney has to carry that on their books as a liability, just in case 1.2 million kids show up and say, hey, here's my Disney dollar providing the service. But to an entrepreneur like me and to many people in the room, uh, you know, 1.2 billion dollars that you got for a piece of paper that you printed, right? It's called counterfeiting, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, but it, we don't have to look at Disney or, or back to uh, the days of uh, Con Smith. Uh, we can look at Ottawa. Tracy Clark, did anybody know Tracy? Yeah, of course you would. Uh, Tracy Clark uh, bought uh, Bridgehead out of bankruptcy. And she came to me, this was, got me 30 years ago, and she was a really full of beans young woman. And she wanted to buy a uh, fair trade coffee, it was called Bridgehead, it was in bankruptcy. And the bankruptcy trustee was asking $650,000 for, uh, for Bridgehead, uh, for the assets. And I said, Tracy, how much money do you have? She said, I have uh, $35,000. said, no problem, well, let's, let's uh, make that offer. So we did, and the bankruptcy trustee laughed and said, absolutely not. However, who said this? If you don't ask, you don't go. If you don't ask, you don't get it. There's a big hint on the screen. Gandhi. It's what happened Gandhi. And he actually said that when he was asked, how, are you, how the heck are you ever going to kick the British out of India? You know, you don't have any guns. He said, we don't need guns. We're just going to lie down. We're just not going to serve the British Empire. And a few years, India got its independence. So I said, Tracy, if you don't ask, you don't get it. And uh, eventually, we persuaded the, uh, uh, the trustee to sell to, to Tracy for $35,000. A few years ago, she was building a new roastery in Westboro. Big, big, big new roastery. It has a community use uh, room, a staff training room. It has a, a, a you know, beautiful new store. And it cost $15 million to do it. $15 million. And Tracy has an aversion to debt. Next slide, please. Uh, and so what she did instead was she started to issue a script, right? She called it Plan of Need. And why would people buy script from Tracy? It's because they love Bridgehead. They love her coffee, they love free Wi-Fi, right? She's an underdog, she's a local, they want to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And guess what? They got a 20% return on investment. If you look at your bank, you know, this was just a, uh, an ad I, I put for you guys. Ally Bank is proudly announcing they paid 0.99%. Tracy would pay 20%. So what was Tracy's cost of capital? You would think it was 20%, right? But it wasn't. Next slide, please. What it was is, this is a little complicated, so you don't really have to figure it out. I'll figure it out for you. Is Tracy's gross profit margin is about 0.6. So for every $5 in script that she sells, her actual cost of when people come to redeem it is 375. So her cost would actually net if she made the profit, even though you as a consumer got a 20% return on investment. Um, uh, Tracy made money. Right? So try getting that, next slide please, try and get that from your bank. Canadian banks say this word, what's that word? No. Help me out, come on guys, no. wake up. No. no, they only lend money to people who don't need it. Right? Yeah. And they, that's the Canadian banks are closed for entrepreneurs, trust me. They're, they're, they're just absolutely closed. She raised three million dollars in script, and how much did it cost her? It cost her a negative amount of money. Who was, who was her, who were, who was sponsoring Tracy's expansion? Customers. Customers. Who? Customers. You are a good class. Next slide, please. So, you know, when we look at the Ottawa sports scene, the champions, the Sens, the Fury, the 67s, the Red Blacks, there's a bunch more. Um, these are a really part, important part of building our community, right? You know, when I travel around and, uh, and, and I, I see, uh, uh, um, you know, I do a little bit of urban planning and urban design, and I travel around and I ask people this, do you feel like you're part of Team Montreal, Team Toronto, Team Ottawa, Team Boston, Team San Francisco, Team uh, Phoenix, right? Team Long Beach, I've got clients there. And most people say no. What used to bring people together was the church, right? Or something else, you know, a belief in God. Who knows what brought people together? When I was teaching in, in Stockholm a few years ago, um, I, I learned 95% of Swedes don't believe in God anymore. And I'm not here to talk about God, I'm here to talk about sponsorship. But there's nothing that brings us together today better or, or more close than when your sports team does well. And when I go to the, the, the uh, Canadian Tire Center and the Maple Leafs are playing and 60,000 people are cheering for the Leafs, of which half of those live in Ottawa, I tell them, you're going down the wrong road. Right? You're hurting your own uh, uh, economy because people, when a new sports team does well, you know, they grow two inches taller and lose 20 pounds, which I might need to do too. Uh, 
Do you understand that? And when people are positive and they're charged, and when they go up to each other, you see the Sands play last night? How about the Red Blacks winning the Great Cup? Isn't that fantastic? And they go to these drinks. It isn't just because, you know, you don't even have to like sports to understand it's the one thing maybe that brings us together. Next slide, please. And so why would you sponsor any sports teams? It's partly your responsibility, your corporate social responsibility, your personal, because you want some kind of return on investment, you want to have activation. But also there's something else I wanted to try and teach you tonight. Next slide, please. And that is one thing that I think is missing for almost every offer out there is that if, if Shannon and Chris, you have a dozen sponsors, you have created a family. <coughs> and if you look at these things, somebody who's wearing a little brother suit and a Rolex watch getting out of an Audi, is these, this is a family of sponsorship. And this is another form of activation. So you, you expect from your sponsors, if it's uh, the Red Blacks and Brooks Brothers, the Rolex and Audi are sponsoring you, you're getting money and you're trying to find ways. But you should also put them in touch with each other because they're marketing channels for each other. Because likely somebody who buys a Brooks Brothers uh, suit might also buy a Rolex and, and that might person also might buy an Audi. Do you understand? It works for all manner, whether you're at this level of branding or this level of branding. Next, please. So try and create a family of cross-promoting uh, sponsors, that does sound kind of weird, right? cross um, But trying to do that, look at your family sponsorships and make sure you're giving them extra value so that this sponsor and this sponsor are actually market channels for each other, not just for you. Thanks, please. Anyway, as a little ad for me, I do some real estate investment and business coaching. And I have to tell you, over the last few years, especially as I did more real estate investment coaching, is I started to coach some uh, professional players. I've got three NFL players and a couple of NHL players that I, I coach. And one of the things I coach is for everybody, not just NFL and uh, NHL superstars, but for you and me to do something to take care of ourselves and our families for three generations. I, you know, there's a lot of young people here today, and I've talked to you, Shannon, about it as well. I think it's really important for us not to rely on our Canada Pension Plan. You know, the average CPP in 2016 was $550 a month. That is really, really tough to live on. $550 a month. The United States Social Security is a little better at $1,200 a month, but still is pretty, pretty skinny. So I teach people, whether they're superstar players or just people like you and me, all four or five, six residential rentals and take care of yourself and your family for three generations. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing I wanted to charge you uh, with tonight is think about getting sponsors. If you have a blog, get some sponsors for it. If you have a website, what can you do in terms of sponsorship? Don't think advertising, think sponsorship. If you're doing your next live event, think sponsorship. If you're building this next great event center, think sponsorship. If you're doing a webinar, you're selling any kind of product or service, think about sponsorship. And try and do every sponsorship deal that you do for at least two years. Why two years? Could be three, could be four, could be five. But at least two years because you cut your workload down by half. Next slide, please. So now it's your turn to get going and thank you.